Hello everyone, um, thanks so much for coming. I'm sure you're all uh, curious to find out. Um, not everyone has taken the question so well, as you can see from uh, the tweet on the right hand side. Um, but hopefully the, the talk tonight will be uh, slightly more convincing. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Courtauld. I'm doing a research project on the gender politics of Brexit and visual culture. And so this is some work I've been developing recently. In September last year, Project O, an artist collective, exhibited a video work at Somerset House, which featured two women of colour performing magical rituals in the midst of a post-apocalyptic, watery wasteland. What does such an artwork mean in the midst of Brexit? As I'm sure you probably noticed, the occult and magic is a metaphor that's used a lot by both. The magic in the occult is used a lot by both leavers and remainers to articulate their anxieties about Brexit, but also their insults at the other side. So, for example, David Lammy has described Theresa May making a deal with the devil, while Boris Johnson has blasted the EU for being diabolical, and Donald Tusk has said there's a special place in hell reserved for Brexiteers. To the language of cults, magical thinking, unicorns, we're so used to this all the time. But what's going on there? What are, what are the politics to those metaphors? A few weeks before the Brexit vote in 2016, the New Scientist ran an article exclaiming, gut instinct will decide the most irrational referendum yet. A few weeks later, the Telegraph explained that British voters <coughs> are succumbing to impulsive gut feelings and irrational reflexes in the Brexit campaign. As part of this um, language, we've also heard increasing references to tribalism or um, the uncharted waters of Brexit. And about a year or so after the referendum, The Guardian ran a headline exclaiming, cults, human sacrifice, and pagan sex, how folk horror is flowering again in Brexit Britain. <laughs> and a few months after that, uh, in the same newspaper, Deborah Orr wrote an article in which she explained that she used to think people made rational decisions, but now she's realised they are, quote, all slaves to our feelings and emotions. The trick is to realise this and to be sure to guard. References to the British Empire, often unconscious references, crop up time and time again in Brexit discourse like slavery. And in November last year, Peter Brooks published this cartoon in the Times, which depicted the British cabinet wearing headdresses and, and clothing meant to evoke the North Sentinelese or the Sentinels of North Sentinel Island, using that metaphor of primitivism in a similar way to the, to the slavery metaphor in Orr's article. The caption reads, Explorer finds tribe cut off from the real world. That sense of being backwards or um, being out of control. Irrational, uh, as opposed to the imagined level. Not long after this, in June last year, 
The BBC ran a headline warning, Tower Revival, Tower Revival, thanks to Brexit. Quoting a designer, Tina Gong, who explained, Tarot is to reclaim that control when we feel it, we lack it. The witch symbolizes everyone that has been other and that has no place or control in the world, such as women, people of color, and the LGBTQ community. So this comes at a time when, particularly in the midst of fourth wave feminism, witchcraft imagery is also being reclaimed as a form of resistance. So there are books like Silvia Federici's Witches, Witch Hunting and Women, which talks about the 16th, 17th century as the beginnings of capitalism, as a time when there were these mass witch, witch hunts, but also slavery as an institution. And she argues that these things were all interconnected. And of course, not only did colonialism decimate belief systems of many people of color around the world who were colonized, sometimes using the very, you know, the very same legislation that had been used in the 1730s in Britain, it was exported out. But also, many enslaved people used magical rituals as forms of resistance by casting spells on slave masters or trying to poison them. And, and more recently, in 2018, a book of poetry was published called Spells, 21st Century Occult Poetry, which was all framed through the language of magic. And there are a number of contributions by people of color that are thinking through anti-racism through that idea of the kind of magical performance, reclaiming the politics of that. But this is obviously um, very complex right now because we're in the midst of a moment in which both Leavers and Remainers are repeatedly saying that the UK must be a rule maker rather than a rule taker on the world stage. The latter of which Jacob rees described as a slave state. And so I think you can see how indebted that imaginative binary is to the British Empire. The idea that you're either ruling someone or you're either being ruled. You're either rational, scientific, stoic, or your irrational, backwards, uh, primitive, you know, magical, your magical thinking. And the influence of that, that binary clearly has a, a huge legacy in the UK today. So what was at stake in Project O's artwork being on display in Somerset House? Obviously this is a video in which women of colour perform these magical rituals. Somerset House, the former royal palace, was largely rebuilt in the 17th century as the headquarters for the Navy and later the Admiralty. So it's a building not just meant to represent power, but all the way through the architecture and the sculpture is an image of ruling the waves. <coughs> through, um, you can see on the left here, this is obviously the North Block Portal, the arms of the British Empire and then each of these figures represents the four continents. Or Father Thames over here, and these satires bearing fruit, um, cow's head, tackle, things like that. So this is an image of, of you know, nautical but imperial grandeur, might, control. And in the midst of that, Project O both appropriate that language. I mean, it, it, here you have similar kind of classical figures with the words. And also radically disorientated. Because this is not an image of Britain ruling the waves anymore. Um, it's a very complex image in which the women of colour are both performing, they're in control in the sense that they're performing their own magical rituals, they have their own agency. But they would also um, twist and turn, caught in these traumatic, glitching loop cycles, like past violence trapped in time. These kind of strips and fragmentations. The other thing um, 
as you can see from the bottom right hand corner, is water would leak out their mouths um, and they would multiply into these hosts that would then descend into shadowy dark figures. Clearly evoking a history of um, the Atlantic slave trade, mass deaths at sea, but also contemporary migration across the Mediterranean today and the intense violence and mass deaths in the world. So I think this image is really important for us because it's part of an environment with a much larger crisis about Britishness and the states of Britishness on the world stage today. In January, on the day of the Minful Boat, the BBC ran some interviews with people. And the interviewee said um, there was a strong sense that we're all at sea. And one interviewee said, I would like us to be a great nation out of the EU. But another dissented, explaining the idea that we can return to the empire. That ship has sailed and it is over. And a couple of weeks later, The Guardian ran an article asking, Britannia rules the waves. After Brexit, it will be floundering. And some have argued, Brexit needs a day of reckoning. Britain needs a day of reckoning, and Brexit will provide it. A humbling must come to pass. And so much of this imagery is accompanied with ideas of shipwrecks or drowning or being at sea. Because I think across the referendum divide, many people have internalised this idea of British greatness, British mastery, influence, power, importance. You know, from comments like, let's get back to being the British Empire, the UK will end up as a colony, Britain is stepping down from its role as preeminent, or Brexit will make Britain less influential. Actually, I think we have to reevaluate some of those ideas of what Britishness means today, and whether we, you know, whatever happens with Brexit, because I think one way or another, it's hugely damaged and disorientated that idea of. I mean, I often see, you know, people on Radio Four saying, you know, whether they're Europeans or not. Or they're from the UK. Wasn't Britain meant to be really good at administration? Wasn't it meant to be really, um, you know, controlled or stoic? Or you know, it's like your rational uncle going, you know, having a nervous breakdown, etc. And in all of those comments is, is an idea, a deeply internalised idea of Britain that is starting to unravel and is coming to the surface. And is in the midst of a profound crisis. And obviously I can't tell you what will happen and uh, you know, the future feels pretty violent. But I think there is an opportunity here to reevaluate that binary, that imagined binary of being a rule taker or a rule maker. Or that sense that Britain needs to rule the waves or order around other countries or have that implicit sense of mastery. And perhaps we can turn to artworks like this to give us an image of Britain no longer ruling the waves. And in fact, it might be through the very metaphors or language of the occult in which we can think through and challenge that deeply internalized binary of the rational versus the irrational, or the, uh, the good administrators versus the people who supposedly need a custodian to the conflict. Perhaps that humbling is really vital and important in terms of how we imagine our future right now. Um, so yeah, Brexit, perhaps Brexit is in the cold. Thank you.